Greetings everyone and welcome to the webinar. My name is Akanksha and I would be the moderator today. This webinar is in co collaboration with industry experts like John Hansen from Procurement Insights, Mark West from Future Purchasing and Kanish Kosh from Zykus. Before we start, a few housekeeping tips for you all. At any point of time, you may send us your questions in the Q&A box and they will be addressed towards the end of the webinar. Introducing Zykus, as you may know, Zykus is a leading global provider of complete source to pay suite of procurement performance solutions. Our comprehensive product portfolio includes applications for both the strategic and the operational aspects of procurement. Zykus has again been recognized as a leader in Gartner's magic quadrant of strategic sourcing application suites in 2017. Now, uh, let me take a few moments to introduce uh, to you all to our speakers today. We have with us Mr. Mark Webb, who is a specialist procurement consultancy and educational provider. Since the co-founding of the company in 2003, Mark has helped more than 50 businesses to adopt category and supplier management and make them core business competencies. He has worked with leading global companies in the technology, hotel, media, electronics, FMCG, as well as public sector. Mark is also the co-author of three global reports on category management, the most recent of which was published in February 2017 collaborating for category management success, bridging the performance and value gap. Our next speaker is Kanish Kosh, who heads the product management team for Zykus' source to pay suite. He has been working in the enterprise product management space for more than a decade, primarily involved in designing best of class applications. He has been instrumental in successful procurement application adoption by a large number of global thousand organizations. He has also authored numerous white paper and solution documents and has been actively uh, working for world class procurement practices in different industry events. Now, Last but not the least, we have with us John Hansen from Procurement Insights as the editor and lead writer for the Procurement Insights blog, which has more than 25,000 followers. John has written more than 3,000 articles and papers, as well as five books on subjects as diverse as supply chain practice, public sector policy, emerging business trends, and social media. In addition to being a much sought after speaker and moderator internationally, John is also the host of highly acclaimed PI window on the, the world show on Blog Talk Radio, which has aired more than 800 episodes since its initial broadcast in March 2009. Now, without taking any more of uh, the time, I would now pass it over to John to start the webinar. Thank you, Akanksha. And you know what? It's great to be here. And Mark, thank you for joining us. You know, we were talking, I guess you could say, in the, in the, in the green room uh, beforehand. And uh, I'm sure today's discussion is going to be very, very interesting uh, as we proceed through it. So I'm looking forward to your insight. Now, before we get into the actual heart of it, I want to remind two things that, that you should note about these webinars. Number one, uh, after the webinar, we're going to have a tweet chat throughout the next day. You can join us right away, but there'll be discussions using the hashtags Brexit exit by, and that's on the screen there. We encourage you, again, to join the group. We're going to have other people uh, and uh, industry uh, thought leaders uh, sharing their ideas as to uh, what exactly uh, Brexit's impact is going to be or has been or will be on the uh, procurement world. The second thing I want to remind you as well is this is very much an interactive experience. And uh, with our webinars in the past, even though there's a Q&A at the end, we encourage you, I encourage you, if you have any thoughts or any ideas uh, that you want to share, don't wait. Share them in the Q&A section. Uh, both myself and Mark will get to them on a real-time basis, and we really want you to be part of this discussion, part of this experience. And of course, to start and lead that off, we'll also be providing you a series of polls, which you can respond to. And I believe, Akanksha, we're, we're giving everybody about a minute to respond on the polls. And uh, these questions are very important because they, they help to really shape the discussion in terms of the direction it is going. Uh, now, uh, one thing I want to point out uh, is that we're going to 
focus on three things. What is Brexit? And we're not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, we're going to give a general background. This is really for contextual reference points. Uh, and, and Mark, you'll have some added value on there, I'm sure. We're going to look at what is Brexit's effect on procurement? Like, is there a tangible, real effect? What is it? What do we do with it? How do we deal with it? And then finally, uh, we'll turn it back over to Zygus to talk about procurement technology and how it can be leveraged to, to help organizations more efficiently and more effectively in the, uh, in, in the transformation or the transition. So let's start off right away with the very first poll, which is what is the level of impact that Brexit has had on your organization's procurement practice? Has it been significant? Has it been moderate? None yet, none expected. So we're doing this. Uh, Mark, what do you think about all of this in, in terms of let, – let's start off with the poll question here. What do you think is going to be the answer for most people? Oh, just waiting. Where is Mark? Hello? Hello, John. Sorry, I think I've been cut off there. Well, technology, that's great for a live webinar, too. It always happens, doesn't it? Anyway, yeah. Mark, what, what, yeah. what are your thoughts? You know, we're, we've got another minute to go. What, what would be your thoughts in terms of how people will respond to this? Will, uh, I think, yeah, from what we've picked up from clients, uh, there's not been really much activity as yet. Um, and not as much as we would have expected anyway, a little bit of planning and risk planning uh, going on. But in terms of changes, um, it's not really kicked in because there's so much uncertainty. Well, now, this is an interesting point, and, and, and perhaps you can help, uh, you know, uh, add another uh, additional insight into this. When I was doing some research on this, it, what was interesting is, is that the general consensus was there would not be a lot of impact per se, uh, but the impact that would happen would happen beyond or behind scenes that people wouldn't expect. For example, uh, a switch to dealing with more regionalized or, or national or local supply chain. One of the things that came out, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, is that even if you're dealing with someone locally, that still doesn't mean that there isn't going to be global or, or, or beyond uh, expectations, are there? No, uh, no, not in. Uh, as I totally agree. And one of the other things that happens with these sort of things, with reading around the topic, is things happen slower than people anticipate uh, to start with, and then they really accelerate. So it's very much, um, you know, finding out what's going to happen, what is the outcome of negotiations, which is going to shape people's practices. Albeit we can see things happening in certain parts of the economy, uh, changes that are occurring, parts of the EU that are leaving the UK. So there are, there are things that you can visibly see starting to change, but at the moment I think a lot of it's hidden. Well, and, you know, we actually see that right now on the screen in terms of the response is that 16% said significant, 23% said moderate, uh, moderate, but the majority said not yet, none yet at least, and 3% said non expected. And, and I guess when you talk about that non yet, uh, none yet type of thing, what you're really seeing is people who, who maybe expect it, but it hasn't materialized in any tangible way for them. Uh, I mean, that's the safe bet in, it, in this, isn't it? Absolutely, you know, people don't know what to change yet because there's no certainty on the outcome. So, um, you know, in six months' time, if this thing proceeds over the next month, you know, this is going to change uh, significantly, I would imagine. Certainly, once we get into the final, approaching the final 12 months, as people enter 2018 and start doing planning, uh, then it's really going to start to bite because, you know, then the reality will hit home and we'll know exactly what some of the economic outcomes that have been negotiated will be. Well, and you know what's interesting as we move into the next phase is, you know, and, and just to give some context here, but one of the thoughts that, that, that come to mind here is that where there is the anticipation, and to you uh, who, who are attending this webinar, I'd be very interested in your thoughts. What was your basis for wanting to attend this webinar? It, it, again, the majority feel none yet. Is it, is it that you anticipate there'll be an impact? And if you do, as the, the poll results show, maybe share with us what you think that impact would be. I mean, Mark, that'll give us some interest 
interesting perspectives and insights. So again, I encourage you in the Q&A section, by all means, share uh, some of the things that you believe or feel may be, uh, may be some that will have an impact. Uh, because, it, Mark, let's face it, it it'll, it'll help us in terms of our direction of being able to respond and say, okay, if your concerns are in these areas, and, and we'll, again, elaborate or expand on this, uh, certainly you'd be able to address that directly, I would imagine, correct? Yeah, hopefully so. Okay, so again, I want to encourage you to do this. Uh, and again, so Kelly's asking, understand the current position. So uh, basically, uh, I take it what, what you're saying there, Kelly, is is that uh, you really want to get a chance to know uh, what this all means because you have a general idea of po potentially impact but don't have it. David just asked the question, is the UK and the EU uh, post-Brexit will be close partners despite uh, the respective stance? Is there a potential that new technology adoption will actually accelerate? perhaps becoming the world's new benchmark for state cooperation. Now, see, that's an interesting question, Dave, and, you know, I know we'll cover that a little bit more when we get to the uh, next section, but, but what are your thoughts on that, Mark, uh, in, in terms of that? Is technology, what impact will technology, do you believe, have in terms of the acceleration of this? Yeah, the, uh, you know, I'll take a step back from th that for one second, because what we've got is a negotiation that's going on that, frankly, you know, for most people from a business perspective, certainly on the UK side, it doesn't look like it's being managed in a very professional or uh, very successful way at the moment. It seems very adversarial. Um, use of technology at this point in time, I think we've got to get, you know, some of this is about relationship management, understanding the other side and seeing the overall impact of what we're trying to achieve as a, as a country with a GDP that's you know 1.9 billion pounds um, and we're putting some of that at risk uh, and, and obviously securing that for most people in business that's the number one and you look at all the uh, the analysis that people like uh, SIPs have done you know negotiating tariffs uh, and quotas and making sure that we get frictionless commerce that's that's the number one item on people's agenda the use of technology to achieve that at this stage you know we're all we're all looking really towards the people that are involved in these uh, what are effectively face-to-face -face negotiations, which when you look at the, uh, the visible side of what we uh, see and uh, in certain things like the Public Accounts Committee in the UK, you know, the, uh, you don't get a, a sense, nobody gets a sense of uh, this being handled in, uh, in what is a successful way at the moment. So, so okay, and, and David, let me know if, if Mark answered your question. Before we get on to why did Britain leave the EU, uh, Priscilla, I believe organizations will take future investment or expansions on sites located in the UK with more carefulness as we need to have added costs. This is seen as a risk. Would you agree with Priscilla's uh, perception there? Yeah, all the, all the views are, you know, investment is going to be, uh, you know, the, the investment level is, is dropping off. Uh, there's a flight of capital that nobody's talking about. So these things are happening. And obviously, it's uncertainty. Um, and when that sort of situation is around, nobody is going to make, or there's going to be less propensity to, uh, to make those sort of decisions. Some organizations are, and you just hope that this is just choppy water that we are sailing through at the moment. Uh, again, I think there could be more reassurance from the uh, politicians that they're handling this in a way that's trying to avoid that. But it, it is, um, it's hard to see the way forward totally at this stage. Certainly, you're not getting a sense of maturity, certainly, from some of the people involved. All right. Interesting enough. Hopefully, Priscilla, that answers your question. And the impact, let's ask this thing, the impact of perceived tax or perceived as tax exchange rate fluctuations, any trading costs for uh, suppliers out uh, from out of the U.K. that will pass on to U.K. companies. So there, there's the concern uh, by uh, Ferzana that there will be added costs pass, passed on in the way of taxes, for example, and exchange rate fluctuations. Um, what's your thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, no, that's exactly what's, uh, what the concern is, that uh, we'll, we will end up in a situation where we've got, obviously, uh, free trade um, uh, throughout the EU, and we're part of the customs union, part of the, um, the, uh, um, the single market, and we're getting all the benefits of that. And what's going to happen is that we, in the worst case that everybody's talking about, is that we end up on World Trade Organization tariffs, which, you know, I was speaking to somebody about yesterday in the food sector, and a lot of people don't really know the complexity involved in those uh, tariffs, which ones actually apply to your product at which state of production. It's 
uh, it sounds like it's extremely complicated. So anybody who's got understanding of the WTO traffic tariffs is going to be in a good position at the moment, I would have thought. But it's, it, it looks like you know there is a potential at least for additional costs being added on in one di in both directions. So uh, that obviously is not going to help anybody's economy. Right now, David just added one point about the uh, about his his earlier comment uh, is that it wasn't mostly about the negotiation process, but we say despite looking like chaos, what's happened today has largely been predictable. So there's an element of I would imagine for David in terms of the poll response, uh, if it is indeed predictable, uh, you'd be one of those who's saying as well. I know what the impact is or, or likely will be based upon the direction of these things. Let's let's go to the and I just want to spend a little bit of time if we could on you know. The, the three points that were cited for uh, the Brexit uh, happening in the first place, one was economics, the other was uh, immigration, the other one was national identity. And I want to stress to everyone at this particular point in time, I'm merely sharing the headlines, not from one side or the other, or offering these as valid points one way or another. But these were, by and large, the, the three reasons that were presented. Uh, Mark, anything to add to these in terms of this? Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, for people outside of the UK who probably, you know, only read the headlines, there is underneath each of these areas, there are uh, reasons, there are things that have gone on on the economic side. Uh, yeah, there's money that goes to Brussels. Probably most of us didn't know how much it was, how much the net number was uh, throughout the campaign uh, for the um, uh, referendum. There was numbers that were bandied around, some of which were distortions, um, but, you know, the numbers actually it's about 7.8 billion euros in total, um, and that's a net figure. So, you know, that sort of number, you know, has to be born against the, uh, the total value of the economy. But people didn't really, I don't think everybody totally understood that. Uh, and the point about national identity year you've got there, UK does not see itself as part of the EU. Again, I think it's fair to say that, you know, a proportion of the, um, the electorate doesn't, um, but a proportion does, and it's the younger people that do. It's the people who've got degree, um, degrees that, uh, degree level education, which do, and it's still like a 70-30 split. People without degrees and older people uh, don't see themselves as part of it and voted against the uh, remaining, and the people that um, were younger and do have degrees were in favor. So there's over time, and this is one of the things that isn't being addressed because the proportion was 52 to um, 48. Over time, as people die, the older people die, this is getting replaced with people who are not in favour of uh, leaving the EU. So this will create a problem downstream potentially, which I, I just don't think is being addressed um, as uh, the discussions take place. It's almost like this is a one-way decision. But if the uh, population changes in the way that it's looking like it is, then uh, that will be a, um, a question mark about how, how or if this does get reversed at some point in the future. Again, it seems to be headlong uh, in one direction at the moment, but I think that will, uh, will rear its head in a, in a few years, and it looks like 2021. Okay, now before I get to before I get to JE's uh, question, one thing I want to ask is this, and, and this is interesting, is that um, you know when a program gets started, we've seen these world over, North America, everywhere, uh, where once a once a certain path you you go down it, is there a point of no return? Because you mentioned something very interesting here, Mark. You're saying is is that as generational uh, transition occurs, uh, the, the 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 review of this will be this wasn't necessarily the best idea. And again, we're not giving merit one way or another to this in this discussion. We're merely uh, giving some perspective. Is there going to be a point where it's going to be too late to pull out? And the reason I ask this question is, is, is sometimes you're, you're in so far, it costs more to pull out than it does. You know the old saying is the, the, the treatment's worse than the original illness. And again, not saying one way or the other that it's good or bad, uh, but certainly, I mean, that's going to be a consideration as we progress down this path, isn't it? I think it, I think it will be, uh, and then hopefully, if that sort of perspective is uh, kept in one eye, then there will, by the people that are involved in this, then the solutions uh, that are sought out of this hopefully will be constructive ones that mean that that isn't, you know, obviously it's extremely costly. You could argue wasteful, a lot of activity going on. But the, if, if the, uh, the view can be retained of how do we make something out of it which is even better, then you're going to get a, um, uh, a result that people will say, well, we don't really want to reverse it. If it becomes, you know, in, in the, certainly the trend and the way that it's being portrayed in the media at the moment is very, it's adversarial, it's uh, fighting over, over numbers. 
um, then that is not really that sort of mindset of trying to, uh, you know, this is like a typical negotiation. You're trying to grow the pie, not, not shrink it or fight over the, uh, the elements of it. But at the moment, we're in this, this phase and maybe we'll, we'll migrate out of it. And, uh, you know, that will be an interesting thing to see if it becomes more constructive as a way of doing things that maybe help the EU grow and change also. So there are, there are constructive ways out of this. Um, it would be good to see some of those things uh, raising their heads. Well, now before we transition to get into the procurement side of the equation, one thing, and J.E., I'm coming right back to you now, and thanks for the question. Uh, J.E. asks, can you please say again how much the U.K. is giving versus receiving from the EU? Uh, well, it gives uh, the total numbers uh, is £7.8 billion, uh, pounds, which is what is being spent um, into the EU. But there is, you know, that's the net figure. There is four billion or five billion, in fact, which comes back. Um, so it's actually a 13 billion total. But then you're getting these rebates, some of which aren't, again, very well publicised. Uh, direct research payments uh, to the private sector that isn't being talked about. That's over a billion uh, pounds. So the net impact is 7.8. Um, but that includes the four billion rebate that we get plus this extra um, one billion into research grants. Again, oh. you, it's only because you start reading around this topic that you suddenly get a bit more of a handle on, on what the numbers actually are. Um, and, and we've had, uh, you know, historically, we've managed to negotiate um, things uh, quite well, I think, to, to the country's advantage. So it's not been uh, um, an area where we've not been active in the past. We have been negotiating different elements, uh, opt-outs of certain things as well. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Jay, for the the the, uh, the question here. Now let let's go and and let's just transition on. Um, oh, poll number two, and and this is where it is. You know, it was very interesting when we looked, Mark, and saw those results. Where none yet, but anticipated. What areas of procurement are most affected by Brexit? Now, for those who said, well, none yet, of course, your answer would be, what are the areas that you anticipate? will be most affected by Brexit. And I'm talking about the rebuilding of supply networks and risk management, and somebody had alluded to that earlier, uh, trade tariffs on costs and currency hedging, and uh, the increase in demand for procurement talent, which is, I, which is one that I thought was very interesting and we'll expand on a little bit more uh, because it seems to be a, a universal problem that even extends procurement talent beyond the Brexit uh, scenario. But, Mark, when you look at these options, would there be another option that you would add to this, or does this pretty well encompass uh, uh, all of the, uh, I guess, would you call the key or core areas of procurement that can be impacted? Well, I think the, the one thing that I would add to this is that um, it's, a, it's an opportunity to refresh category strategies and, and uh, supplier strategies because there's a real focus on, on particular elements of that, um, you know, supply market research, what are your options, uh, su supply and value chain analysis, obviously looking at the what it is actually the supply chain that we're operating with. So I think that's one of the things that um, I think will will play into this. Uh, but obviously, the, the number one thing here is is the risk piece and understanding what the risks are. And that starts with understanding what the supply chain is that you're currently using and where elements of that are are, are in the U, UK for uh, EU-based, uh, not EU-based, but um, continental-based organisations, and also uh, from the UK side. You know how much of the supply chain is actually outside of the UK um, in Europe. Well, now, you see, here's an interesting thing. The results have come back in. 38% say the rebuilding of their supply networks and risk management is one area. Uh, the the uh, overwhelming or, well, reasonably overwhelming uh, response uh, has been 58% uh, saying it's the impact of trade tariffs on cost and currency hedging. And only 4% say the increase in demand for procurement talent. And, you know, when I look at this, Mark, uh, and, and maybe before I get my, my thoughts on there, what do you think of this? Anything here surprises you? Yeah, the trade tariff thing, I think it's because it's just so unknown what those, to what extent those things could apply and what distortions it will make on, on decisions that are people have made. Um, and the other bit outside of the tariff, obviously, is the, uh, the physical sort of potential for um, the supply chain being affected by um, customs and things like that, and certainly the direct materials area. Although the G you know, UK economy is 80% services, it has to be said. So um, it's this unknown of what those trade tariffs might be, I think, is, uh, is definitely uh, an unknown factor. And I, whoever's been studying the World, World Trade Organization tariff uh, website is uh, certainly had a quick look at it uh, in the last couple of days and thought, mm, that's, a, that's a 
a tasty way to spend a few hours. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be interesting, and, and that's where the focus will have to be as part of the uh, the uh, risk assessment. Well, and, and you know what? What's, what's interesting about this, though, that I see is that traditionally, if you look at the role of procurement professionals, traditionally, uh, the cost factors was usually on the end result of the bottom line, and not much a focus on, you know, how those costs were derived. I mean, do you see this potentially, and this is just my take on this, do you see this potentially as a reflection of the evolving maturity of, of the procurement profession as a whole, that they are looking at these things more deeply and, and more involved than, let's say, they would have 10 years ago? What are your thoughts? Uh, well, I think what we're into here is, is stuff like uh, price cost analysis and, um, you know, it's also going to be total cost analysis, which some people have been doing, obviously, for a long time. Uh, and it's, you know, people have been importing, you know, in the electronics industry, obviously, you're importing stuff all, all around the world and there's all sorts of uh, different supply chains that are in, pl in place. This is just making something that happened within uh, the EU now more, as complicated as something that happens outside the EU. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is... Um, it is a, a, a requirement going forward, as you say, that people are going to have to spend more, more time on price analysis, understanding how cost is built up a little bit more, what is our current exposure uh, to some of the elements within the, uh, the cost breakdown, and also on something, as I say, the total cost of ownership over a period of time. You know, a lot of people doing category management have been doing this type of piece uh, before. I think for some organizations where it's more of a, a price-based decision-making organization, then, uh, yeah, they're going to have to learn some new skills, some more analytical skills for sure. Well, you know what, and for me, this looks like the, the move from the, the, the traditional transactional mindset or way of doing things to the more strategic impact that procurement can have. Because, you know, one of the, one of the things I found interesting about procurement talent uh, in reading many of the articles uh, is that they're saying is, is that there is going to be an increased demand on procurement uh, capabilities uh, that wasn't necessarily there previous in terms of expanding their scope of involvement, their, 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 their depth of understanding of the situation. Uh, and, and, and that's really what's, what's another part that's interesting to me as well along that same discussion line we just had, is that we're, we're now moving to an era where, again, and I don't know if you'd say this would be the right way of saying it, but we, we're becoming less transactional and more strategic as a profession. I mean, and, and Brexit, and in fact, dealing with a global supply chain, doesn't that really give that, uh, that, that, that it's sort of a driving force behind that, isn't it? Yeah, I think it will only, um, you know, bring the focus onto, you know, dem being able to demonstrate real understanding of the supply chain and the, and the cost elements within that, and how you control um, these aspects and how you make decisions on a, on the most uh, the most rational basis possible with all, with the full set of information, which you know, again, Fortune 500 companies have been doing anyway uh, for the last 15, 20 years beyond, you know, for some of them. Um, in the direct material space especially. Uh, but it will bring it more into focus for everybody because it, it, it's, it's obviously creating a degree of volatility. Again, hopefully we, we sail through this period and things become a bit more stable. Uh, but at the moment, you can see all sorts of uh, you know, worst-case scenarios that people will, will be aware of. Right. Now, as we, as we move on to the next one, and, and, and I'll touch on these percentages here, but one thought that came to mind is, is the supplier um, – uh, perspective, you know, how how does this change? Just very briefly, because I don't want to digress too much off the beaten path here, Mark. But how does how does this change the supplier's view uh, of, of uh, dealing with 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 purchasing people? I mean, this has an impact on them as well. Yeah, I mean, the feedback we get from people at the moment uh, from uh, UK-based uh, buyers is that it's more difficult to deal with. Uh, with suppliers at the moment, especially you know the EU ones, because they, um, you know, the, the quote I heard was the British customer is uh, less of a good bet. Now that that's just a short-term negotiation ploy, uh, and again, you just feel that this is going to be used in certain negotiations uh, as part of a, uh, you know, a, a way of um, resisting price negotiations with uh, UK-based organisations. It's, it's bound to happen in, in certain situations. It's uncertainty. You can use it as an argument, but uh, hopefully, over a period of time, it becomes it becomes less relevant. That would be the expectation. But you know, you've got the statistics statistics also, these SIPs ones, and they're talking about, you know, the replacement of uh, UK suppliers, um, sorry, of uh, EU suppliers uh, by UK business and vice versa. 
the question is how much of that will actually occur. People looking at it is one thing. What's the total cost of making those change? What's the switching cost? Uh, there's probably there's a right thing to do to look at it, and there's an expectation that some of it will happen. It's all a question of to what extent does it actually happen, and what are the total costs of making those changes? Well, and is this interesting? It sort of leads into uh, uh, William' uh, question or comment. He said the issue impacts the SME rather than the multinational. 180k businesses only trading in UK with EU. These costs they cannot absorb. So, what are your thoughts with that? I mean, is this is this an SME problem, or is there any particular one area that's going to be more negatively impacted than another uh, from a procurement standpoint? Yeah, I think with a, with a smaller business, it's definitely you haven't got the ability to balance the different uh, elements of you know where you're actually selling stuff, where you where you're producing stuff, and you know it's hellishly complicated to see. And in a big organisation, you know this is going to get absorbed. I would have thought relatively easy. It may affect the country sort of uh, P uh, P and L uh, particularly, but generally speaking, you'd think it's not substantial. If I was running a UK business that traded, you know we sold goods, and I know a number of that do this, uh, you relatively small businesses that sell goods into the EU, then yeah, of course the tariff side of it. And also the um, it's the perception piece as well. There's, there's an emotional piece in this that I don't think helps um, UK sellers, particularly at the moment. Again, it's it's not helped by the way that um, you know, the negotiations overall are being perhaps conducted. If they're done in more of a a uh, constructive way, then I think people would it would it would feel like you know this is something we just got to go through. We all know that you know that there's value in trading with uh, in, in between the UK and the EU, and, and such a big proportion of our, our trade certainly, you know, seven out of the biggest uh, trading countries we deal with are in the EU. That's not going to change. Uh, so th there is a bigger picture here that we I think we constantly have to keep a keep a sight on. Well, now this slides nicely into Kelly's question, and, and David uh, also just wanted to say his switching costs he thought was a great point. But Kelly is indicating that we have global contracts in place. Will they need to be renegotiated, or would we have to break away from them? Uh, potentially, they, they, uh, they will be, obviously. Um, people are renegotiating. Um, you know, I think uh, some of the, the, the statistics came back from June was that 29% of companies are renegotiating. And there, there's certainly there's, there's a, a difficulty in getting people to uh, commit beyond a certain time frame because of the uncertainty uh, next year. Again, you're hoping that this will, will change. But I would imagine that there will be renegotiations. Uh, obviously, there's, there's currency-based renegotiations, which have been... Um, caused by a 15% um, reduction in the value of the pound since uh, the referendum, so those you know people will be trying to claw back some of the uh, the benefit uh, of that. So yeah, I think that there inevitably will be more more negotiation, more price based negotiation. But obviously, you know the the more um, the more. I'm kind of trying to try and work the, use the right phrase here, but that certain procurement people will be looking at the bigger picture and, and negotiating not just on price. It will be the, the broader aspect of what they're looking at. It might trigger certain things that should have happened anyway uh, in certain instances. I think all of these things, you know, it's, it's important to keep a positive um, frame of mind about how you can use it to do something positive, not just that this is all uh, all very negative. Okay, now uh, hopefully, Kelly, that answered your, your question. Uh, please uh, let us know if it has or if you want more added on to it, and, of course, any other questions. Here's a couple of questions that came from, from the mainstream. It, it, what is the best plan? And, sir, this follows on, uh, yes, Kelly said that did answer a question. Uh, thank you again, Kelly. Uh, one of the things uh, here is uh, uh, along Kelly's line is what is the best plan to replace suppliers without disrupting operations? What are your thoughts about that, Mark? Uh, what is the best plan to disrupt? Uh, yeah, no, I think I think it's 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 to um, it depends on on exactly which situation you're in. Even in the indirect spend, there can be long-term relationships. Are they going to be switched out for a short-term gain? And again, this comes back to the two organisations. Uh, I think what happens at um, political level and intergovernmental uh, will hopefully be not replicated at a business level because there's value in, uh, in long-term relationships. So I think, uh, yeah, there will be lots of renegotiations, I'm sure, but hopefully they're done in a slightly more um, productive and uh, constructive way than uh, we're seeing it outside. Now, one of the things David added is for manufacturing businesses, it's likely to have a cost impact in terms of higher inventory safety stock costs, um, 
and, and supply networks are also uh, going to be need uh, need to be reconfigured. I, I guess that's a, a, a point worth noting as well, Mark. What about how do you screen new suppliers or second and third tier suppliers to minimize risk? I mean, you know, if you have to go through this change without disrupting the operations, I mean, risk does become a factor. What are the elements of risk we're going to face because of this, and 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 how do you minimize it? Well, I think it's, it, you know, one thing is to have a very clear view on uh, what type of risks you're looking at. So there's some commercial risks here, you know, price increase, tariff increase, potentially quotas. Uh, and then there's the assurance of supply type of risk as well. So uh, availability of labor. I mean, that's going to impact certain industries in the UK. And we look at this from a procurement perspective, which is important, but there's an overall business perspective here to take on board as well. You know, if I'm um, in the food industry in the UK, heavily reliant upon uh, EU labor. So if that labor, uh, and, and the obviously the, um, well not obviously, but the, the um, migration levels are dropping off into the UK. So that, um, you know, I think it's down to 233,000 net migration versus 350,000 uh, 12, 18 months ago. So that's going down. What does that mean in terms of what the business can um, can actually do? That's threatening some people's um, actual business. Never mind just the switching of you know if you rely upon that labour, this is much more significant. So I think there's the assurance of supply bit, and obviously this whole piece about customs delays, uh, where you've got people like Honda saying they've got you know they're totally reliant on 350 uh, lorry loads of parts coming across the channel each day and uh, they've only got about one hour's worth of stock on hand so you know is that going to be this lean manufacturing approach is that going to be threatened i you know potentially obviously it could be and uh, but all these businesses are lobbying government and hopefully on both sides of this to try and come to a to a situation where we're not going, you know, rolling the clock back 30 years to introduce inefficiency into business, because that's what it could end up as at the moment, and that's the big concern. So okay, think, now to me, yeah. it's commercial risk and assurance of supply, they're the two big areas of risk I would be uh, looking at. Now, in terms of, and you know, we've already touched on tariffs, we've touched on currency hedging to to a certain degree. Um, what areas of other areas of cost should we plan to address? And oh, before we get to that, Mark, JE has a question. Do we know if the cut of people coming in the country is going to affect companies based on the UK databases only? What are your thoughts for, for JE there? So just run that question past me again. Uh, he said, do we know if the cut of people coming in the country is going to affect companies based on the UK databases only? Uh, I don't follow the second part of it, but I mean, I, I honestly, I, I don't know, uh, because what, what could happen and what's likely to be happening is registration. And, you know, there, there's been talk in the past of an Australian style system of points uh, to allow people, you know, that are required in certain sectors of the economy to be allowed in and then unskilled labor not to be allowed in. Whether that happens, uh, who knows? So I think uh, you know it's, it's very hard to know exactly what that profile. That that 233,000 is net migration. This this you know, when I looked at the statistics uh, previously, it's uh, you know that's because um, an equal sorry half of the amount of people uh, leave the the UK as well. So um, you know, and without knowing exactly the profiles of those people, but obviously it does impact in certain sectors. You know, medicine. There's a um, again a high proportion of people from the EU and outside the EU who are discussing, and you read this about nurses and doctors from the EU uh, countries deciding that uh, it's less of a favourable environment to work in. So there could be, but again, it's just a sense of you know this might happen at this stage. Right. Okay. Any other areas? Just briefly, in, in, in a quick minute, because I know we, we want to get through to the next slide, but. Uh, any other areas that we haven't covered, Mark, that we should be thinking about in terms of supply? No, I think, you know, we, we're talking about labor, we're talking about direct materials, um, and uh, both of those are the two areas that, uh, that need to be thought about. And certainly from, from the UK perspective, I think uh, that uh, all of those, you know, the costs that we're, and, and of course, the, um, you know, really understanding how the suppliers uh, operate, what their, uh, what their workforce looks like, that is really important in some of these areas now because, you know, even in the tech space, there's lots of, obviously, a lot of people working in, uh, in and around London. Um, does this impact them as well? And if these people, these organizations are in your supply chain, you know, we really need to know 
uh, how it almost be um, as part of the understanding of their strategy. What is the uh, the employee base of these organisations? What are they doing to retain? What are they? And this is all about communication, which is one of the things that's a lot softer, but is really important for procurement people to get really actively involved in in the dialogue, as, as I'm sure they are, uh, with uh, with the uh, suppliers to understand what they're seeing, what they're feeling. And, and really to triangulate some of that, because you're not going to be told necessarily that they're hemorrhaging staff, which could happen, again, in certain sectors, or losing key staff that are really important. So I think this is about using all aspects of uh, you know, the, the skills that procurement people have. Some of it is, is about networks and about really building up a, uh, an understanding, along with their, again, with their colleagues in the business, business stakeholders. So this is a very, you know, it's an opportunity to work very closely and to re reinforce those links uh, with business stakeholders, because this, you know, if operations are dependent on suppliers and suppliers are dependent on their teams, then you know, we really need to understand where those potential risks are and do everything that we can to help those supplies mitigate them. Well, now let's look at this because this segues nicely into the next set of questions regarding what new skill sets will procurement professionals require. Uh, Desislava uh, asks, should businesses make a provision of increased training costs to prepare for the post-Brexit reality? What are your thoughts on that? Let's, let's make this a two-part question. Is What are your thoughts in terms of that? Should they make provisions uh, uh, for increased training costs to prepare? And what new skill sets outside of what we have now, and we've touched on previously of, of some of the inherent category management skill sets, what new skill sets will be required? I think the one on you know on investment in procurement. Uh, there's always a reason to um, you know to invest. The overall levels of investment in procurement versus sales um, are are pretty low in comparison. So procurement teams don't generally get the levels of investment. Some do, but many don't get the level of investment that they require. This is, this is potentially, again, I would think smaller organizations, it's new skills, particularly around risk management, um, will be really important. If there's been no formal training on that, I would think that's one of the areas that, uh, that's required. And, um, you know, the speed at which this needs to be done uh, suggests that you wouldn't want to uh, spend a lot of time training your own people to do it. So there's, there's opportunity here to, uh, to skill people. And again, looking at it from a positive, it's an investment in the future. Um, and there are all sorts of spins on this in terms of the value that can be created. Because for me, as I said before, the, the ability to create a, you know, for your key suppliers, a relationship strategy for those guys. So this is, a, if you haven't done it, it's an opportunity to do that and to get trained in an ability to, to have those two, three, five year plans. And also on the category side, to have proper strategies which really pull apart the big areas of spend and expose all these, these things that we've been talking about, the risks, and also potentially the opportunities that might come about. Again, we don't see too much about opportunities at the moment, but having an up-to-date strategy and having the ability to create one and, and build it with the business, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to use it as a means to drive that, especially in businesses where procurement may not be involved in all aspects of the spend. Again, uh, thinking about it as a, as a positive. Okay. Now, and by the way, William, we'll get to your question about AEO uh, towards the end because I want to move on to the next because we want to then get into the technology side. Public versus private sector impact. Is there a difference? You know, if you're a procurement professional in the public sector versus the private sector, what, what's the impact? Well, yeah, I mean, for the, the, it's the OG regulations and the application of those, uh, which have been very stringently applied in the UK, supposedly, over the last um, 20, 30 years. Um, and will those things apply in the future? Um, potentially potentially or likely not there's going to be if it goes in the direction that you can see that there's a there's a potential for uh, there those those regulations to be obviously um, removed and uh, jettisoned and uh, and a potential to to not to have to publish things or to and to make the uh, whole bidding processes that exist currently which are, are transparent and are open to everybody within the EU to make those things a bit more uh, localized potentially. 
which again you could use as you know as a multiplier effect in the uh, the economy if you can uh, you can do that. But again, I don't know the statistics on how much of uh, public sector spend goes outside of the UK. Uh, to be able to see if that's a that's a potential opportunity, but I could imagine that it will be a political uh, football that will be kicked around if uh, if much of the spend was used outside of the uh, the UK. Again, it depends on the final solution that's arrived at with the uh, an agreement made. But then, and in that interest, because public private sectors, because there is the belief taxpayer money, public sector should be spending money to drive. Uh, regional economic benefits or, or national benefits and build up industry within the country uh, as opposed to others. So, I mean, that kind of question would, would, even without Brexit to a certain degree, would come into play if the money was being spent somewhere else. Uh, anyway, I mean, is, is that a fair statement? It's a question, but then um, it's a fair question to ask. But I don't think, I think most of it is done on a um, an open basis because there's so much challenge that goes on in a uh, public sector environment if uh, if bids are not felt to have been dealt with a in, in dealt with in a fair way those get challenged and the, the costs of those can be absolutely astronomical and uh, there's one in the UK at the moment to do with uh, rail infrastructure which is running into hundreds of millions of compensation figures uh, that is uh, being paid so or, or going to be paid so uh, I think you know it's always it, it, it's portrayed as a level playing field. I hear in some areas it isn't quite as level as it might be, but uh, right. it is, it is, a, it is a, it's an argument in favour of you know using it to drive the economy. But then you start making decisions that um, you know, could end up being quite quite distorted. But in back to 1960s, 1970s interventionist um, activity, which is it's certainly not been seen for a long while. But who knows who might take over in the in the uh, government in the UK, you can see a lot of that sort of uh, approach being reignited. All right. Well, let's go to our, our third and final poll before we hand it back to Akanksha. Uh, procurement technology can be leveraged to minimize the impact of Brexit. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, disagree, or uncertain. So now, again, in this poll will be very interesting because, you know, there's often talk, uh, Mark, about the impact that obviously technology has, uh, the streamlining, the procurement process, all the things back, uh, you know, you know that, that have empowered more people to do much more and freed them up to become more strategic in their thinking. What are your thoughts? What kind of response would we see here? What do you expect to see? Yeah, I mean, you know, procurement technology, if it's, you know, most of, I would imagine, a large proportion of the spend is P2P and it's, it's e-sourcing suites. Is that really going to make much difference? I don't think so. But spend and analytics, definitely understanding who the suppliers are that you're using with some degree of accuracy, which amazingly some organizations still haven't got their, uh, their mind around. That definitely will, will help, uh, as will anything to do with risk analysis, supply chain mapping, where people are able to uh, do much more penetration, uh, multiple tiers of the supply chain, and uh, to make that visible. That stuff definitely, to me, would be of... Uh, uh, would be of use, um, but the P2P e-sourcing suite type of um, aspect, I, I don't see that really helping in any way. See, so realistically speaking, it, it, it's transitioned or moved beyond the transactional elements of procurement into the more strategic, the intelligence and business intelligence. I think this reflects sort of in, in the answer itself is that 41 percent, the majority, uh, somewhat agree that uh, it can be leveraged to minimize the impact of Brexit. 24 percent disagree and 21% are uncertain. So maybe now is the perfect time and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call on uh, Shank, uh, Akanksha and her team. I'm going to pass the ball back uh, to, uh, to you on this regard uh, and uh, uh, maybe you can take it from here. Hey, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Mark. This is Kanishka. here. Um, again, I mean, very interesting discussion. And, you know, I come from the technology space. I've been working with uh, procurement solutions for more than a decade now. And what I see is this probably is, I mean, looked at as a huge opportunity too for a lot of uh, the players out there. Because as procurement practitioners, here I have a lot of opportunity to show my management, you know, how much value that I can bring to the table, right? And obviously tools will play a big role in helping me do that. Uh, so I look at it for those, you know, uh, the, those, uh, you know, leaders as a huge opportunity that we can leverage right now. Now, when I start thinking about it, right, the first thing that talks about is managing this change. Now, this change is going to be huge. Now, 
how can a procurement solution, and I'm not even talking about Zykus, I'm talking about all the other leading procurement solutions out there, how can these solutions kind of help you uh, manage this change, right? Now, the first thing is obviously you want to free up time so that you can actually focus on the critical work that is required. So, you know, if you can automate stuff, uh, make things go away, that is where, you know, your time is saved, your time can be addressed to actually understand the impact of Brexit, right? Now, there are simple examples. For example, uh, you know, approvals. Now, approvals should happen directly from the system, right? Your, uh, the tool that you're using should be intelligent enough to send out a reminder that this particular approval is pending. And, you know, automatically probably have rules for auto approvals or auto escalations and auto uh, delegation. So those kind of stuff actually kind of makes life easier for the procurement user, right? Now, I want to kind of talk about a couple of things here. Uh, for example, now we're talking about configurability, right? Now, if you want to address the impact of Brexit, you might want to now have certain uh, new changes. For example, you know, one thing we keep hearing from customers uh, is that, you know, can I now create a, probably a new supplier survey, right? Now, I want to send this across to all my suppliers, get the results back, which will really help me impact, uh, understand the impact of my supplier base. Right now, I should have a way to quickly send out this particular form, uh, get the data. The system should be able to analyze that for me and send it to me. Uh, you know the the forms, the business rules, workflows. You know, creating new fields and templates in different products. Like, I think you know Mark was speaking about how you know uh, sourcing tool or the purchasing tool would probably not be really helping you uh, in this process, but where supplier and spend analysis really comes into the place, and we completely agree to that. Right now, just uh, kind of moving on to this. Uh, we wanted to now obviously then focus on the supplier side of it because the way I see it, supplier management is probably going to be the biggest uh, uh, impact area for us, right? Now, what? Let me kind of break that down into individual components here, right? Now, supplier analytics. Now, when you talk about supplier analytics, I kind of I'm clubbing that with spend analytics. So, what as an organization you want to do is understand your complete spend, and you might want to even include the tail spend that you would have. Take into account all the different suppliers, the geography where the spend is happening, from where the purchase order is getting issued, uh, where actually the goods are getting delivered, and so on. And you can now dissect and analyze the spend based on this and really figure out how much risk uh, do you have and what do you need to do to mitigate that risk. Now, again, what the world class uh, tools can do for you is let you know that predict those uh, risks for you and let you react to those risks, right? It is not about you kind of doing that work manually. You can actually predict the risk and work on that to yourself. Uh, there can be, you know, monitoring and alert, and that's what we're talking about, which will actually help you anticipate that risk. Now, we will come to some other stuff, like supplier uh, management, right? And that becomes critical in this particular situation. So what uh, you would want to do is understand your supply base, Find out where there's a need for migration, and then you can also, you know, separate your suppliers based on strategic suppliers as well as non-strategic suppliers. Now, if you have a particular component which is key to your manufacturing process, and there are only probably just one or two suppliers supplying it, now that becomes a critical supplier for you, right? Now, if you feel and if you see that because of, uh, you know, the Brexit challenges, you would probably have, you know, EU rules where you would have to you know, purchase from certain suppliers in certain geographies, and this supplier could, you know, come under a risk, uh, you can fit that risk profile into the tool. So the tool can actually suggest for you that you have a strategic supplier here who could become a challenge going forward. So what do you do to mitigate that risk? Right? And the idea behind that is, again, uh, we spoke about uh, training and spoke about learning about users. The tools today, uh, what happens is these, these tools are easily built. So that for an end user, the learning curve is pretty uh, low. You don't have to you know, go through those, you know, huge uh, manuals and so on. Uh, what you need to do is you can actually have the users log into the tool. The tool will suggest uh, if you are stuck somewhere. The tool uh, understands that you know you are kind of uh, not able to find the right way to move forward. Uh, it'll uh, you know give you those intelligent alerts and pop-ups and tell you that you know this is the way you can kind of find your way through the system. Right? So the way 
it happens is the supplier management tool today, uh, we can look at it in two parts. One is it's a pure tactical or a functional element which will just help you drive your business process and two, it can actually take you to the next level where the tool is intelligent enough to suggest those remedial actions as well as uh, highlight certain areas where you probably need to focus on. Right now, just uh, moving on from uh, supplier management, the other thing that would be probably critical to you is the whole uh, efficient contract management system. Now, obviously, you have you know a large number of these contracts that you have with different uh, vendors, and you would obviously want to understand all these uh, contracts. So, if you're going to break down in, that into different parts, the first part is the discover. So what you need is a very uh, robust uh, search mechanism which can find out all the contracts that you have based on certain key uh, metadata. Now it could be obvious like supply name or you know geography and so on, or it can actually look into certain uh, strategic keywords within the actual contract and find out, for example, payment terms. Now anywhere you have a contract which is uh, you know, having a payment term of, uh, you know, something which is not acceptable to you, you can actually search that. So you have discover, and then you can act. Uh, so act could be something that you take on your own, or it could be something that is uh, initiated by the system itself as kind of intelligent uh, actions, as well as you have the audit and maintain, so where the system will prompt you on how to maintain those contracts, you know, set up internal alerts and so on. So you can actually have the tool kind of manage the entire process for you to uh, understand the right set of contracts you want to action on. So as a, as, as a procurement professional, uh, you can now focus attention on the top X percent of the contracts which really needs your attention in, in case of any such uh, impact, right? Now, we just wanted to quickly kind of focus on the how a tool can help you manage this change and kind of uh, take care of the challenges of Brexit, which could have a lot of impact on the procurement professional. Again, uh, the way you wanted to kind of tie it up with the entire solution, or just keep it for the last few minutes at the end, is just to tell you that a, a, a solution can't really solve the Brexit challenge for you, but what it can do is it can be a very good partner for you, where by helping automate things and getting information right at your fingertips, will help you solve all the questions that are posed to your way very quickly and very efficiently, right? Uh, with that, what I'll do is I'll just kind of leave you with the Zykus uh, suite of uh, solutions. This is our comprehensive solution footprint, and you know this is something that obviously you can uh, look at and you can leverage this for any kind of requirements that you would have to uh, mitigate the challenges that are going to come your way. Uh, at this point, I'll kind of again open it up for any questions that you would have uh, for everybody on the panel. Just waiting to see. Now, if they need additional information at sign out, of course, there's an opportunity with the Zykus page to provide comments and feedback as well as questions as well, I would imagine, correct? Yes, I think, uh, yes, that is correct. And also, there are a couple of questions, Mark, uh, John, which have been asked, I think, after uh, uh, I started. I think if you can look at them, we have a few minutes, maybe we can take those questions right now. Okay, let me just look and see. Uh, okay, uh, one person, Kelly's asking for a copy of the presentation. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's something that can be provided. Uh, the PowerPoint, there'll be a recording, so this will be on demand uh, overall, uh, Kelly. So absolutely, you'll, you'll be able to uh, request that. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the kind of questions, what kind of questions do you usually get relative to uh, when you talk about uh, utilizing uh, the technology to address uh, the Brexit change? So again, you know, as I was mentioning, so probably, you know, uh, in the interest of time, uh, it is mainly about how my, how, you know, a technology partner can solve and help me answer the questions. So like, you know, what you mentioned probably earlier, right? Uh, there can be a situation where I want to do a spend analysis and find out, uh, you know, the, uh, the set of suppliers who supply me certain items in a certain geography where my spend annual is over X dollars or X uh, uh, euros, right? Now, I can easily run that uh, query and get that data immediately, or I can even have the system have alerts which can kind of trigger the information for me immediately into my mailbox, into my system. So the, what people come back to us is, is how can I manage this in a good way? 
uh, where the different uh, you know regulations change. Like you know you, we had that whole OGAU guidelines. Now you know things might change, and there will be very uh, lot of flexibility and fluidity will come in. How can I very quickly uh, transform my system to kind of adhere to the new set of guidelines? So those are the kind of uh, questions that keep coming our way. Okay. All right. And again, if they're uh, and and and. Uh, uh, Desislav asked, have you got a technology solution that helps manage the currency risk? Uh, that's something that just came up here now. What, what, what? Uh, to, to some extent, I mean, to some extent, yes. So, for example, if you're talking about, you know, uh, pure hedging, obviously, you know, that is not something that a procurement solution would do. But we do help you, you know, kind of benchmark your spending against different indices which can kind of give you an idea of, you know, how much you're spending. Uh, we have dynamic uh, exchange rate uh, calculations that can kind of tell you that, you know, how much would you be spending in a different currency. There are different ways we can kind of uh, bring in the whole currency uh, concept so that it, the information is much readily available. So, you know, what we can do is uh, uh, we can probably take this question offline and, you know, you can reach out to us in Zykus and we probably can have a much more detailed discussion on this. Okay. Well, thank thank you so much. Uh, now I want to just end, with Mark. In terms of some questions that came up, and and uh, Des, uh, Deslava, thanks you for the answer. Uh, Mark, if I could just turn over a question to you because we only have a couple of minutes left, or maybe a minute left. Um, it, two things. Lily has asked. Uh, or well, actually, uh, Lily's asking this regarding the technology. Do you have also have a predictive analytics tool to predict the future situation in terms of pricing, supply, and demand? Uh, actually, yes. So that was a great question, Lily. And we, we have uh, some good stuff that you can probably leverage or look at. So we have, uh, as I said, you know, uh, benchmarking in market indices, uh, be it like, you know, studies like World Bank or some of those very niche indices where you can look at how the uh, prices are changing. Uh, two, we have a robust spend analytics solution uh, where, you know, you can have certain algorithms which can actually help you predict your future spend based on what you are spending right now and also identify areas of savings. Uh, so I'm not sure, Lily, if that is exactly what we're looking for, but what we can do is, again, connect uh, offline and uh, kind of figure out exactly what can help you out of current need. Perfect. Thank you so much. And now one more question for you, Mark, just to go, and this is Lily. Is there any major concern in relation to trading rules and regulation in relation to Brexit? And maybe we'll end with this question. Just run that past me again, John. Uh, Lily asks, is there any major concern in relation to trading rules and regulation in relation to Brexit? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the whole uh, point around these WTO tariffs. So in certain industries, like agriculture, it adds 25% on uh, to the cost. So, uh, yes, that, that it's understanding where, you know, if anything you're buying really is uh, being impacted by those tariffs particularly would be my start point because those may not apply but you know in terms of just really understanding uh, you know where where are they you know 0.5 percent across your um, potential uh, cost base across your categories of spend and where are the really high ones that would be a start point to map those those um, tariffs so you can see like you know again it's worst case but it's only from a UK perspective that that could be where the, uh, the tariffs are um, uh, going to hit hard and obviously if you spend a hundred thousand on something it's completely different than if you spend 10 million on it or a hundred million on it so uh, that's that's obviously what people are doing at the moment is is working through what are those worst case scenarios based on uh, a set of tariffs that may or may not be applied all right then well listen we'll end there and uh, I can't show, uh, uh, we'll turn this back over uh, to you to close but uh, again mark uh, a great and insightful discussion. I want to remind everybody uh, that uh, you can join the tweet chat. It will start shortly after the conclusion of this webinar, and it will continue to be up on the hashtag uh, Brexit by uh, capital B R E X I T capital B U Y, and uh, that'll be over the next 24 hours or so. The discussion will be there, and there'll be additional uh, sharing of the poll results and comments from the wider uh, uh, procurement community. But uh, thanks so much, Mark. You know, it's been a pleasure sharing this time with you. Thank you, John. It's been, uh, it's been very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kangsha, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Kanesh, for all the great insights you have shared. Uh, just as a reminder, we will be sharing all the presentation deck and the video, on-demand video, to all our attendees and the registrations in a day's time. Thank you all. Have a great day.